Well, thanks very much. And um, thanks very much for giving up your Sunday afternoon. So what I want to briefly talk about is some of the ideas behind this concept of a paradigm shift going on at the moment. This is from a US philosopher. He's very famous. Uh, there's no, simply no polite way of telling people that they've dedicated their lives to an illusion. For most of us, we've been part of that illusion or the fictional world that I talk about in economics. And for many of us, even though we're well-intentioned, we've made political choices based upon living within that fictional world that's been created by mainstream economists. The reason we've got to break out of that fictional world is because these things that I'm going to talk about today are, are constants and in, very important in our lives. A lot of people sort of turn their nose up and say, oh, economics, for God's sake. But it's constantly in our lives and a driving force in, our, in the way in which political decisions are made, which directly affect our well-being. And the problem is that macroeconomic concepts are quite difficult, even for students who are in economics. The concept of a macroeconomic aggregate is quite an abstract concept. You, uh, it's, it's quite difficult to actually get your head around that. And uh, one of the things that, that I'm aware of these days is that social media is really exacerbating that uh, lack of understanding, that difficulty. And uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, so-called experts on social media and I'm not talking about critics of my work, but also those who uh, might have a predilection to it. It's not a great place, social media, for debate. And the other, the other aspect is that uh, macroeconomics has been housed within all sorts of different ideological agendas that abuse the difficulty of the concepts and, and create this fictional world. And the, the whole neoliberal agenda over the last three or four decades, depending on where you live, relies on you and I being ignorant about macroeconomics. They exploit the fact that we're ignorant. They build up our ignorance through very sophisticated framing and language and co-opt us into being part of their agenda setting through the political process and social media, those agendas have progressively undermined our prosperity. And what modern monetary theory is, is a new way of thinking about macroeconomics that I believe gives the progressive side of politics hope. So that's sort of what I'm gonna talk about. So full employment era, what did we learn from that? The, the Great Depression taught us one thing, and that was that the government could use its fiscal capacity, that's spending and taxation, to create full employment. What the Great Depression taught us was that capitalism, left without that government support and government intervention, would create crisis and large amounts of unemployment. It was endemic to a, an unregulated capitalist system without strong fiscal support. The Great Depression didn't really end until the end of the 30s with the prosecution of the war and the large deficits that accompanied that prosecution. And that clearly taught governments that strong spending support would create work and production and income growth. And the Great Depression unemployment ended with that military effort. Now, the problem in the, the early days of the peace in the 40s was, well, how are we going to continue to maintain that full employment without blowing the hell out of each other, having to uh, build tanks and armaments and things like that? And most government around the world had major policy statements. In, the, in Australia, it was the 1945 White Paper on Full Employment. These were very familiar all around the world where governments committed to nation building, to using its fiscal support consistently to maintain sufficient spending so that when the non-government sector uh, wanted to save overall and withdraw some of their income from spending, the economy didn't go into recession and instead would remain at full employment with that fiscal support. That's what the full employment era taught us. And it was quite clearly understood then that any unemployment that was uh, realised was due to a lack of spending. 
and uh, it was a systematic a failure of the economy to produce enough jobs. It was nothing to do with the individuals who, who were the victims of the lack of spending. And that the solution was quite clear that we needed to use uh, fiscal capacity to redress that spending gap. So they were the things that were understood throughout the 1940s, 50s, 60s, into the 70s. The breakdown in that consensus occurred in the uh, early uh, 70s. It wasn't a very uh, a rapid paradigm shift in the sense that the, the monetarists, Milton Friedman and his gang, were at their program for many years earlier. Uh, they were fighting against the social democratic consensus in the 1950s and the 60s. And what allowed them to gain ascendancy in the academy which then filtered out into the policy making processes within central banks and treasuries, for example, and then broadly into the population, was the dislocation related to the oil crises, the OPEC oil price hikes, first of all in October 73, then a bit later on. The price of oil doubled overnight virtually, and for oil dependent nations, that caused a huge shock. Uh, that the governments were uh, underprepared and, and really did, hadn't worked out how to deal with properly. And of course, we had uh, double digit inflation almost everywhere and the way in which governments responded was exactly the wrong way and to create uh, large scale unemployment, which disciplined the inflation process, but caused massive damage. Uh, monetarism assumed a credibility that it didn't deserve. There was a, there was a paradigm shift. So in my lifetime, I've seen one paradigm shift in economics, which tells me that they happen. Now, the interesting thing, and we deal with this in the book, Reclaiming the State, was that at that time also, the world was opening up. Trade was becoming more global, but particularly financial capital flows were much larger in the late 60s and the, into the 70s. And part of this monetary story, the, the creation of this fictional world, was that nation states, the fiscal capacity that nation states had used throughout that full employment era, was now no longer effective uh, against the power of global financial capital. This was an agenda that was prosecuted very vigorously by the conservatives. And of course, this played into their political agenda that they wanted to stop social democratic governments running welfare states and they wanted to confine the fiscal capacity of nation states to underpinning profitability of capital. And there was a very famous document in 1971 commissioned by the uh, US Chamber of Commerce. They commissioned a lawyer called Lewis Powell, and this is the so-called Powell Manifesto, and it's available to read. I've written about it. And this was a strategic agenda where capital could fight back against the social democratic forces, take over the media, create think tanks, infiltrate the education system and, in, and get rid of the lefties and so on and so forth. And that set the agenda for capital, which they used the uh, concepts of monetarism to their advantage. Now, you know, at that time in Australia, I was uh, just a, a young student, but the big, big debates, and these were worldwide debates, were trade union power, the profit squeeze, and all of these things. And, and the agenda was quite clear. They wanted to break down the social democratic consensus. And, you know, we've now got in the 50-year archive rules of cabinet documents in Australia from 68, for example, we have now can see that, the, you know, the big bosses of the peak bodies of uh, industry were writing letters to our, the Australian treasurer imploring him to uh, create more unemployment deliberately to break the power of trade unions and discipline the wage process so that there could be a redistribution of national income towards profit away from wages. Now, it's quite blatant what was going on. But the problem was that the political left bought the whole fiction. If you want to trace the origins of political support for monetarism, it comes from originally from the left. And, you know, the famous statement by Jim Callaghan in the, at the uh, Labor annual conference in Blackpool in 1976 in September, where he made the statement that the idea that governments can use fiscal spending to create work 
is dead. We no longer believe that. Now the responsibility of the government is to fight inflation and to appease, these are my words, international capital. You can go through several other turning points. Jim Callaghan laid the groundwork for Thatcher. It was, Thatcher wasn't the first monetarist government. And then you had the Mitterrand government in 1993 in France, elected on an anti-austerity platform to renationalise and to restore growth and prosperity to the working class. In 1983, they did the famous austerity term. Jacques Delors was the economy minister in that so-called socialist government, and they were monetarists. And I mean, Jacques Delors went on to become the president of the European Commission and subsequently the uh, chair of the Delors Committee, which, outlined, which was the blueprint for the Maastricht Treaty, which was the whole eurozone creation and the, you know the eurozone is one of the most advanced expressions of neoliberalism that you can get that's that started in the left closer to home uh, hawke and keating they were neoliberals and so was longy and douglas in in your country they were neoliberals laying the groundwork for howard and costello here and for your national government that followed them and the left bought it all. They believed that the nation state was no longer had the capacity to maintain full employment. They no longer believed that fiscal policy was possible in any coherent form because the powers of global capital would sell the country down the drain, uh, crash its exchange rate, and the bond markets would stop funding the governments. Now, what really was going on and what the conservatives knew damn well was going on, short of having private militias in invading countries, and sometimes they did that, but generally they don't do that. And what they understood was if they wanted to operationalise their agenda, they had to do it through these, the legislative and regulative capacity of the state. And so what really happened was not that the nation state disappeared or anything, which is what the left believed, but that the state was reconfigured in the neoliberal pattern. And all of the things that we associate with neoliberalism all been accomplished through the legislative and regulative capacity of the state. And so really what the challenge for the left is, is to reclaim the state. Uh, interestingly, at this time, all of this was starting in the early 70s, the post-war uh, fixed exchange rate system, the Bretton Woods system, which began in 1946 as a means of uh, providing international stability of exchange rates and certainty of exchange rates to provide some certainty for trading in this so-called glorious full employment consensus. That broke down in 19, August 1971 when President Nixon suspended convertibility of the US dollar into gold and floated the US dollar and most other currencies floated after that. The importance of that, and this is a separate talk and I won't seek to explain it, the importance of that was that during the Bretton Woods period, governments had to be very careful how much currency was in the system because the central banks had to maintain the, under the agreement, the Bretton Woods agreement, had to maintain the agreed parities across the, all of the exchange rates and those parities were influenced by how much of the currency was floating around in the economies, in the world economy. And as a consequence, if fiscal policy injected too much currency into the system, then there would be pressures on the exchange rate down and the central bank would have to react to that pressure by withdrawing the currency or pushing up interest rates. And so you had this sort of stop-go dilemma where the central bank, and particularly for countries with external deficits, who were always facing downward pressure on their exchange rate, they were always being pressured to have uh, higher interest rates or austerity type fiscal policies, which then pushed up unemployment and it became politically unsustainable really to maintain that system, quite apart from the challenges of the US economy maintaining the gold convertibility. You know, I could go on for a long time about that, but the important point is that in August 71, when that system essentially collapsed, it took a couple of years to really collapse. But when that collapsed, the central banks were no longer responsible for maintaining exchange rate values. So they didn't have to maintain higher interest rates and, and uh, try to constrain uh, monetary growth. 
and fiscal policy was no longer going to compromise the central bank's exchange rate management. And so governments no longer really needed to issue any debt to cover its deficits. And, and we learned very clearly then that taxation revenue wasn't necessary to fund government spending. That realisation was not uniformly uh, disclosed to the public by economists and the mainstream of uh, profession and the teaching programs and the rest of it continued on as if the world hadn't changed. But the collapse of the Bretton Woods system was a dramatic change. So after all of that, this is the neoliberal support card. I'm not going to go through every line. You can uh, look at a couple of those things and tick them and uh, realise that in different countries, some of these things are more prevalent than in other countries. But broadly, across the globe, these type of outcomes have occurred. OK, paradigm shift. What's, what's happening is that that report card is now resonating. It's taken 30 years, but it's the accumulated damage of those failures of the neoliberal period are now resonating and there's a paradigm shift underway. And the drivers are quite diverse. You've got anti-establishment revolts going on among citizens who realise that the promise that was held out to them of wealth and prosperity, if they pulled their wage demands in and they voted for governments that privatised and outsourced and put in user pays and all of the rest of it, those promises have failed to deliver. And, you know, what's the manifestation of that? Uh, yellow vests in France, Brexit vote, Trump, the rise of the right, the demise of social democratic uh, political parties mainly around the world. Some of them now are virtually unelectable because they played the neoliberal game, thinking that was smart. Another set of drivers is coming from central bankers now. The neoliberal consensus ensured that most of the policy action would come from monetary policy, setting interest rates, and would be biased towards fiscal austerity. The austerity from the fiscal policy has been driving this sort of stagnation, uh, low productivity growth, flat wages growth, bordering now on deflation and, and all of those things in that report card. And central bankers are realising that they're the ones that have been made front and centre of the policy response and they've run out of policies. They, they've realised that changing interest rates isn't very effective. It doesn't do very much to stimulate demand. And uh, they've, they've progressively pushed uh, interest rates to zero and in some some areas in uh, they're negative now and they're sick of being blamed and they're now calling on treasuries to use fiscal policy which has been eschewed under the neoliberal period and the third sort of drivers are coming from the financial community who realize that their business models have been undermined by this neoliberal period why because they can't make a buck on negative interest rates they can't make a buck when public infrastructure has been degraded and uh, run down by fiscal austerity because they've been used to being partners in uh, those large public infrastructure projects. And as they're being uh, cut back through the austerity, they're running out of safe investment areas, the, uh, the financial markets. I gave a talk to PIMCO, one of the largest bond uh, traders, and, the, and we were talking about the maturity mismatch in the big European pension insurance funds. What does that mean? It means that they've got long-term liabilities which need cash flow you know, pensions and paying out on insurance contracts, etc. And they use their asset structures to generate returns that are timed in an appropriate way so they can meet the cash demands of their liabilities. And with negative interest rates and drying up infrastructure opportunities, their asset structure is unable to generate the appropriate cash returns to meet their liabilities. That's called maturity mismatch. Now, what are they, what are they doing? Well, to meet their liabilities and keep their cash flow going in a timely way, that's the maturity way, they're increasingly shifting their asset portfolios into much more risky positions because they can generate higher returns than the negative returns that, and low returns on safe assets. 
and that's exposing the whole financial system, system to collapse. So there's this paradigm shift being driven by all sorts of different forces that would not normally be seen on the same page together. And this has, of course, led to a strong interest in, in my work and in modern monetary theory. Okay, groupthink still prevails. Why has it taken so long? We've been working on this MMT project for 25 years and it's only now that we're getting traction. Well, the, the understanding comes from social psychologists, and this is a whole area of groupthink, that even when a paradigm is degenerating, which means that it can no longer explain very much about anything that's of interest, the dominance of the paradigm hangs on. I hope you can see this table. Japan's a very good example. Japan was really the first post-neoliberal government because when it had its huge commercial property collapse in the early 90s, it took dramatic action in terms of increasing fiscal deficits and providing monetary support to prevent the commercial property collapse becoming a major recession. So they've had consistently large fiscal deficits, above 10% occasionally, since 91. The mainstream of my profession predicted rising interest rates and rising bond yields. The reality is that short-term interest rates since 91 have been around zero. Bond yields are consistently low and they've been negative for many years now in certain maturity ranges and they've had low unemployment throughout. They had one negative quarter of GDP after the commercial property crash. GFC was a small property crash compared to what Japan had in the early 90s. A second row, gross public debt to GDP, the largest in the world, it's nearly 250%. My profession said that that would mean that bond markets would start assuming that excessive debt would become unable to be repaid and that they would demand increasingly higher bond yields if they were to continue lending. And of course, as I said, across the maturity range, yields have been falling towards zero and the private bids in bond auctions for Japanese government bonds have been huge huge demand for Japanese government bonds, exactly the opposite to what my profession predicted. And the other element is that the Bank of Japan were the first really to engage in large scale purchase of government bonds in the secondary market. And in effect, they've been funding these large fiscal deficits. They've been funding them with money creation. My profession calls that printing money which is erroneous, and they say that that, that would eventually lead to a loss of credibility of the central bank and sell out of the currency and all the rest of it. Well, none of that's been happening. There hasn't been accelerating inflation. There's been the opposite. And the Bank of Japan has maintained total controls of all yields and interest rates, just as it always can. And the reality is that this fictional world that my profession relies on us believing in can't explain anything about the real world. And Japan has pushed policy parameters to their extremes, relative extremes, and none of the predictions of the mainstream have occurred. Why? Because it's a fictional world they deal in. Here's a really nice quote from, it's a recent quote from Martin Wolf. He's a Financial Times journalist in Britain. And he's talking about MMT. In my view, it is right and wrong. It is right because there's no simple budget constraint. It is wrong because it will prove impossible to manage an economy sensibly one pol once politicians believe there's no budget constraint. There's your fictional world. But that's not the first time. Here's another quote from a very famous mainstream economist, Paul Samuelson. He was interviewed by Mark Blaug in 1988. I think there's an element of truth in the view that, superstition, that the superstition at the budget must be balanced at all times. Once it is, is debunked, takes away one of the bulwarks that every society must have against expenditure out of control, there must be discipline. Otherwise, you'll get chaos and inefficiency. And one of the functions, very important, and one of the functions of old-fashioned religion was to scare people by sometimes... Uh, uh, by thinking sometimes what might be regarded as myths in the behaving that way, uh, in the way long run civilized life requires. It's very clear that they think it was appropriate and they still think it's appropriate to leave the public in the dark 
by creating, you know, the old fashioned religion was to scare people. The myths were to scare people into, into social conformity and into conforming in the, the, the way in which the dominant paradigm wants you to behave, to serve their interests, not yours. Important to understand, I mean, I hear all the time and you're seeing it in the press now, even uh, Philip Lowe, the central bank governor was talking in this way this week in Australia, that, oh, if we have MMT, it'll be a disaster. If we shift to MMT, won't it be great, depending on which side of the fence you sit? The reality is that it makes no sense to talk about shifting to MMT or that MMT is some regime you can turn on or off or that MMT is a set of policies that you can adopt or not adopt. What MMT is, is a lens. It's a, it's a means of understanding the world that we have out there the modern monetary system that uses fiat currencies, not currencies that are convertible into gold. That's the point I made earlier about 1971. What that lens exposes is the ideology that sits behind policy. Go back to those two quotes I just gave you. What MMT allows you to do with this superior lens is to see very clearly what the capacities of the currency issuing government are and what the consequences of using those capacities in one way or another, austerity or not or whatever. And it lets you see through statements that are, oh, we can't do this because we don't have enough money. Where's the money going to come from? All of these statements that support the fiction, MMT allows you to see right through those. Now, to operationalise that understanding into policy, you have to impose a set of values. So for a person on the left who believes in collectives and public goods and egalitarianism and those sort of values, their MMT understanding will lead to quite a different policy set than if you're someone on the right who believes in individualism and a lack of collective action and private endeavour rather than public goods and what have you. But the two people would have exactly the same understanding of MMT in the monetary system. They would just use that understanding for a different set of policies. So what does it mean to have your own currency? What it means, and New Zealand government has its own currency, it means that there's no intrinsic financial constraint. The New Zealand government can buy anything that's for sale in its currency, including all idle labour, the government's not like a household, so that one of the mainstream fictions is that, oh, the government's just a big household. That plays into our own experience as householders managing our finances, and we know we can't max out our credit card, otherwise we'll be in trouble down the road. We're asked to sort of extrapolate that experience as household financial managers into making assessments about what the uh, capacities of the and options of the currency issuing government are. It's just totally a false analogy. We use the currency, we're financially constrained. The government issues the currency, it has no financial constraints. And so once you understand that, you realise that if there's idle labour, that's a political choice, it's not a financial constraint. The government could employ all idle labour that wants jobs, if it chose to. What MMT allows you to understand is what actually constrains government spending as opposed to the fiction or things that, oh, we'll run out of money or how do we pay for it type constraints that, that drive the political process and our political decision making. Once you have an MMT understanding, you realise that taxes don't fund spending. Taxes serve another purpose. I'll come to in a second. Public debt doesn't fund spending. Public debt is just an elaborate form of corporate welfare. The New Zealand government can never run out of money. And the deficits generate income and saving in the non-government sector and surpluses do exactly the opposite. They kill income growth and they destroy private wealth. So what constrains government spending? The first thing we need to understand is that all spending carries an inflation risk, not just government spending, private household consumption, business investment, export revenue, it all carries risk. That risk is embodied in the fact that if spending in the economy, private or public, outstrips the capacity of the economy to respond to that spending growth by producing real goods and services, then there'll be inflationary pressures. Prior to that point, there won't be any inflationary pressures coming from the spending. 
Now, what are the constraints? Here's a little example, a choice set to allow us to see very clearly some important points. Two states, is the economy fully employed? That means are all productive resources being used? And does the nation enjoy monetary sovereignty? Money sovereignty means that you issue your own currency, central bank sets the interest rates, you don't borrow in a foreign currency, plus floating it on foreign exchange markets. So New Zealand government is clearly monetarily sovereign. Germany, for example, isn't because it uses the euro, which is a foreign currency to them. So here's very briefly some situations. If we answer yes to those two questions, then what are the constraints on government spending more? The constraints are real. What does that mean? It means this, that all the resources that are the productive resources are currently being fully employed. If the government wants a greater command of those resources, let's say it wants to increase the size of government to pursue a green transition or something like that, then if it starts trying to compete with the existing users of those resources at market prices uh, and trying to buy them, hire them to work in the public sector, then there'll be inflation. So the real, real resource constraint is hit at that point and that's the limits of government spending. So if the government really wanted to run a a program where it increases its command of the productive resources available in the economy, it has to work out a way to deprive the non-government sector who are currently using them of use. And there's many ways it can do that, but a very important way is through taxation. And taxation effectively reduces the non-government purchasing power which create unemployment in those real resources, which can then be brought back into productive use by government spending. And so that gives you an insight into what the role of taxation is, one of the roles of taxation. It's not to fund government spending. The government doesn't need the tax revenue to spend because it it types numbers into bank accounts every day, and that's how our currency enters the economy. But it needs that taxation to, to constrain private spending so that it doesn't push the economy, uh, spending in the economy beyond the resource constraint. Take this example. So now we've got idle resources, as in most economies now, there are no constraints on increasing government spending. And so when there's unemployed resources, there's underemployment, uh, there's uh, machines are not working in the private sector, then the responsibility of government, then it has no constraints on its spending, is to type numbers into bank accounts and run programs up to the point where they get back to answering yes to that question, in other words, full employment. That's the responsibility of a government in a democracy, in my view. It has no constraints. So all of the arguments that they might come out with is how are we going to pay for it and all that, they're just fictions. They're nonsense. They pay for it by typing numbers into bank accounts for procurement contracts, uh, cash transfers and all the rest of it. And until they get back to being at full employment, there are no constraints on spending. For a country like Germany, for example, in the Eurozone, the 19 member states, even when they're at uh, full employment, they have financial constraints as well as real constraints because they don't issue their own currency. And so they're dependent on bond markets to fund deficits. That financial constraint doesn't disappear even when there's idle resources, which is why surrendering your currency like the Eurozone countries did was, is a disastrous thing for an, a, a nation state to do. Because even if they've got idle resources, like mass unemployment as they've got now, the bond markets can still hold them to ransom and they can't do anything about it. Essentially, a currency issuing government like New Zealand has two choices if it wants to have a stable inflation environment. It can either use what I call an unemployment buffer stock or it can use an employment buffer stock. Now, at the moment, the New Zealand government and most governments use an unemployment buffer stock. What does that mean? It means that when there's inflationary pressures in the economy, The government will tighten fiscal policy, the central bank will push up interest rates and they will deliberately create unemployment to discipline wage demands, to squeeze profit margins in the product markets and that disciplines the wage price type spiral pressures in the economy. And the the problem is that that 
is an incredibly costly approach because using unemployment not only re results in massive daily income losses, it also has a whole series of personal and family and community pathologies, crime rates, mental and physical health, family breakdown, social dislocation, all of those things that sociologists and psychologists tell us about. And the other problem is that if you then try to ease the unemployment, you may well trigger the inflationary spiral then. So it's a really costly way to discipline inflation. The alternative is to use an employment buffer stock. What does that mean? That means that the government offers an unconditional job offer to any worker that doesn't have a job and that job offer is at a social inclusive minimum wage. In other words, it's at the bottom of the wage distribution in the economy, which is adjusted upwards if necessary to ensure that the lowest paid workers have the ability to participate in society, which means that it's not a poverty wage. It means that they, they can a minimum wage worker can have a holiday, can go out to dinner occasionally, can go to the football or to the to music or whatever. They, they, they can participate in society. But the important point of that is that the, the government is buying off the bottom of the market because the unemployed workers have what we call zero bid in the market. Nobody wants their services. And so by buying those workers, the government is buying a resource that has no bid for it and therefore that spending can't be inflationary. And ultimately, uh, why it's a buffer stock is because when the private sector is stronger, uh, it can then bid the workers back out into the private sector, back out of the job guarantee, and the buffer stock would contract. Now, in normal times, at, at high pressure economy times, the buffer stock would be relatively small. Because if you think back to how, the, uh, how Western governments achieved full employment in the post-war period, it wasn't because the private sector was strong. It was because most governments around the world maintained a small buffer of jobs always available. In Australia, it was in the local government, in railways, in the big utilities, the infrastructure utilities like roads and housing. And these, you could always get a job in those areas on any time you wanted. And those jobs contracted and expanded depending how strong the private economy was. The advantages of a job guarantee over a unemployment buffer stock approach are, are massive. And I've listed some of them there. You, you can have, choose your hours of work. So you eliminate time-based underemployment. You can participate in career and training development. You can target the jobs because they're unconditional they are spatially targeted. So you don't get this problem of hollowing out of regional areas in our, in our countries. You can make them green. A massive advantage is a second point there that uh, one of the real problems of children growing up in jobless households, especially long-term jobless households, we know from the research evidence is that they inherit the disadvantage of their parents. By seeing their parents always being able to work, that stigma and that disadva intergenerational disadvantage is not as pronounced. Now that's in bold here, it's not a panacea to everything. It's the base position that any government should adopt. And I'm not saying that the response to this pandemic should be just a job guarantee. Job guarantee should be a permanent safety net. You don't want to see it as the only government response to unemployment. There's so much work to be done in improving the scope and quality of public services uh, that we need career public servants being re-employed to redress that, the problems of that neoliberal report card. The job guarantee is just a small part of it. And the last point I'd make is that a lot of people are really up in arms about the concept of a duty to work. Now, I'm of the ilk that says that in a a society based upon collective values, where the government has a responsibility to ensure that everybody can have a job, then the citizens in that economy, that society, have a duty to contribute to the well-being of the society through their endeavours. A lot of progressives find that offensive. They believe that a person should have the right to opt out and still get income support. The way I see it is that 
at the moment, our societies haven't evolved to the point where the majority of people, especially the working, the, the traditional working class, are not, in, not yet ready to accept people who can work, not working and still receiving an income from the state. Everybody understands that if you're sick, if you're old, if you're young, if you're disabled, then you should be fully supported. Well, not everybody, but every progressive thinks should be fully supported by the state at a very uh, substantial level to ensure that their lives have, have uh, meaning in relative to the, the rest of society. But I don't believe the working class is yet ready to accept people who can work receiving a state uh, payment and not contributing at all and relying on the work efforts of others for their consumption goods and their leisure goods. But what we do need is a, a massive re-evaluation of the concept of productivity, what is meaningful work. And the job guarantee allows us within the paid work culture that I just mentioned to really push the boundaries as to what we would allow to be within the, uh, an employment buffer stock. As a closing point to think about, uh, I live just uh, very close to the, one, some of the best surf beaches in Australia on the East Coast, and I would allow surfers to be in the job guarantee. Now, what would they do? They'd go surfing, of course. Now, what else would they do by way of reciprocation to the collective one of the problems in our summers here is uh, water safety and people drowning. And who best knows the uh, 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 dangers of the water than surf? And so I would have uh, surfers surfing and enjoying their lives and being creative in the waves, but I'd also have them required to take water safety training sessions for school kids. Highly productive, totally outside the box of what we currently consider to be productive work, but that's a way of pushing the agenda towards a much more collective, leisure-based uh, society without violating the current paid work culture. So I think that's enough and I'll take questions.